thank you for coming. We're honored to have you here. And I want to thank you for letting your children ride these buses with us and giving us the honor and the privilege of being able to bring them to church and teach them the Word of God. Uh, that is big stuff for me. Listen, I'm a parent. I have five sons, and I'm very, uh, one little girl just went, I didn't have them, my wife did, okay, so you can do that for her, not me, but uh, I'm very particular uh, about who my, my children are with, and so for you to entrust your children with us on Sundays, that is a big deal to me, and I appreciate that, and I want to thank you very much, and right after this service, we'll, we'll dismiss those uh, uh, bus families to go back to the back for their meal, and um, uh, now, some of you <coughs> cook, and I want to thank you for cooking and, and helping and bringing stuff. And if you would like to go back also, we want to let the bus families go through first and make sure we have enough, and then others can come back and sit down with them and get to know them, and you welcome them here. We are so glad to have you. As a matter of fact, if you rode a bus this morning, uh, or if you came for somebody that rides a bus, they invited you. Uh, would you mind just stand for me, everybody that rode a bus or are here because somebody that rides a bus invited you? Just stand right on up. I, uh, now, come on now. Don't be. I'm not going to have you sing or dance or anything or make a speech, okay? All you, you know, hey, y'all kids right here rode the bus. Come on, looking around. Deontay, did you ride a bus in here? Well, stand up then. Boy, what's wrong? Big old football player scared to stand up. What? Oh, hey, let's give them a hand. I don't, and you can be seated. And there are more that didn't stand up. I was watching you. But we are glad to have you here. Also, let me go ahead and explain how this uh, is happening. We're taking some pictures of our, our church members and um, uh, for the purpose of the directory. We're going to do that right back there at the back wall, okay? We'll start with those, the older first, the senior citizens, and uh, we'll immediately following the service, we're going to take that wreath down, move that table. Sean's going to take pictures. If you would line up around the wall this way, he'll take a picture, send you on your way, and we're good, and we'll be getting that done as much as we can, so we'd appreciate that. Psalm chapter 81, Psalm chapter 81, I want to talk to you this morning, the title of the sermon would be, Open Thy Mouth Wide, that's what I do three times a day, if not more, meal time, I like to open my mouth wide, amen, and uh, People say, preacher, you eat fast. Well, that food's not there just to look at. Hey, man, I, I want to put it in there where I can taste it and eat it. <clears throat> Bible says in Psalm 81, we'll read this whole chapter at 16 verses. You just follow along. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take a psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed at, on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel and a law of the God of Jacob. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt where I heard a language that I understood not. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were delivered from the pots. Thou calledest in trouble and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee. O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me, there shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. All oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should, have, I should soon have subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. He should have fed them also with the finest of the wheat, with honey out of the rock. Should I have satisfied thee? Let's pray. Father, I sure do love you, and I thank you for loving us and being so good to us. What a wonderful shepherd you are. Now, Lord, as we look into your word, give us minds to understand and hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. Draw us closer to you. 
in Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 81, and by the way, I love hearing them kids say amen. It don't bother me if some of you adults say amen. That doesn't hurt my, as a matter, this, this is my microphone, and this one's yours. You feel free to use it if you like to by just saying amen or praise the Lord, and that's fine with me. <clears throat> Psalm 81, written by Asaph. The first five verses, Asaph is speaking to the children of God, the Israelites, and he's telling them, listen, hey, sing aloud. He's saying, make a, a joyful sound, make some, play some music, get the harp and the timbrels, and, and let's, let's praise the Lord, and let, let's sing. He, he tells them to celebrate the feast day, probably the Passover, as he's been talking about deliverance from Egypt. And that commemorates their deliverance from Egypt. And he said, listen, listen, do you see what God's done for us? Hey, it's time to sing. It's time to play some music. It's time to celebrate. In verse number 6 through 14 now, instead of Asaph talking to the people, the Lord himself is talking to the people here. In verse 6 and 7, he reminds them of their forefathers and the bondage they had been in. 400 years as slaves in the land of Egypt. And he tells them, listen, I heard your cries. Those 400 years, your forefathers, they cried out for help. They cried out for deliverance. And and I heard their cries, and and I delivered them from the slavery. I answered their prayers. You see, I am a God that hears. He proved himself to them, even in the midst of their complaining and ingratitude. And man, they would... They would leave Egypt, they'd come up to an obstacle, and they would immediately forget all that God had done for them before. Aren't we a lot like that? They'd forget all that God had done for them before, and they'd start complaining, well, God just brought us out here to die. Moses, what are we going to do now? There's the army of the Egyptians, there's the Red Sea. Moses says, hey, just stand still. Let's see what God has to do here. Well, God sends a wind and, and divides the Red Sea for them, and they walk across on dry ground. The moment the last Israelite steps out of that seabed there and the, uh, the uh, Egyptian army's chasing them on that dry ground and, man, God just lets the waters loose and drowns that whole army. Man, God proved himself again. Then they get out in the wilderness and, man, Moses, we're thirsty. You just brought us out here to die, didn't you? We're going to thirst today. I think, I could not. Lord, what do I do? Moses, go over there and smite that rock with your staff. And he, he hits that rock and, man, the water starts gushing out. Enough water to, to quench the thirst of over three million. Oh, wow, what a great God. They go a little further in the wilderness. Now they're hungry. I'm running out of food. Well, God, you just brought us out here to die, didn't you? Complaining and complaining. And even in the midst of that complaining, in the midst of that ingratitude, God reminds them here, listen, I continued to prove myself to you, didn't I? I fed you with angels' food. Man, I I brought you across the wilderness all those years. Your shoes didn't wear out. Your clothes didn't wear out. Look, I'm a good God. I'm worthy of that praise and that honor. Verses 8 through 10, the Lord calls for his people to follow him. He says, hearken unto me. That's more than just give ear and hear. It means to listen. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Hang on the word. On my words, he says, listen, there shall be no other God in the midst of you, for I am the Lord your God. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, he's saying. I'm Jehovah I'm that God that divided the Red Seas. I'm that God that that, uh, uh, wiped out the armies of Egypt. I'm that God that fed you uh, uh, the angels' food. I'm that God that brought water out of the rock. I'm the one that met with Moses on top of the Mount Sinai. I'm the one that gave my laws to you written in stone. I'm the one that brought you up out of Egypt. I'm the one that brought you to this promised land. He's telling them, I'm the one that went before you. I'm the one that guided you and fed you in the wilderness. I'm the one that fought your battles for you. I'm the one and only the true God, he tells them. It's a reminder that he's the only one who can do what nobody else can. And by the way, folks, let me that, let me tell you, that's the God I'm declaring to you this morning. He's the one that can do what nobody else can. He's the one who can do what the doctors can't do. He's the one who can do what the counselors cannot do. He's the one that can do what the government cannot do. I'm talking about the one true God, the one who goes before us, the one who's before us and behind us and over us and holds us in his hand. I'm talking about that God who spoke the uh, the worlds into existence. That's my God. 
My God, who does not sleep or slumber. My God, whose arm is not shortened that it cannot reach down to help. His ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. I'm talking about the great God, the only God, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the everlasting Father. That's the God I'm talking to you about this morning. It was a reminder to the children of Israel that they owed everything to him. He delivered them. You know what? He didn't just provide for them. He was their provision. He didn't just protect them. He was their protection. He is their very life. In verse number 11 through 14, the Lord speaks of his disappointment that the people had rejected him. He said they wouldn't hearken. They wouldn't listen. I I tried to tell them how to live this blessed life. I I tried to tell them how to have my favor and to have my blessings. I told them, look, if you'll do this, if you'll just follow me and live for me, I'll bless you, I'll take care of you. But if you won't, boy, judgment's going to come. He speaks with disappointment. They they wouldn't hearken to me. He even goes as far as to say, they would none of me. They wouldn't uh, attend to his word. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't surrender to his will. They would not find their delight in him. They would not delight in his worship and in his service. They would have none of his doctrines. They would have none of his wholesome reproofs. They would have none of his laws and government. They would not have him to reign over them. And they would not have him to be their savior, though the only one... There was none beside him. They said, no, God, we we don't want what you have to offer. You say, boy, that seems foolish. Yet how often we see that even today. He gave them over to their own desires. He said, okay, you don't want my laws and, and my commandments and my doctrines and you don't want my provision and my protection and my blessings. You don't want me as your God and me as your Savior. Okay, then whatever it is you want, I'm giving you, you can do it your way. How many of you ever had a child trying to do something they were going about it the wrong way and you said, here, let me help you. And they say, oh, I can do it. I can do it. How many of you ever said to your child, okay, you go ahead. And you knew, boy, this may be a hospital visit before it's all over. They're going to get hurt. They may break something. And sure enough, it ends up with a little boy or a little girl crying, Oh, I got a pooper. Yeah, how you feel now, kid? <laughs> now that's what you want to say. Then. You let them do it their own way. How many of you, when you was young, ever ate, you, you, you wanted to get some dessert or something and mom and dad wasn't looking so you just you just filled up on the dessert I mean you just ate and ate and ate the dessert thinking oh this is heaven boy I'm not eating the Brussels sprouts and the broccoli and the liver I'm I'm eating this cake and this pudding and this pie how many of you ever ate so much that you ended up with a belly ache anybody do that just last night as a matter of fact I <clears throat> God says to the children of Israel, that's what you want? Okay, you can have it. They lost battles as a result of that. They lost lives to their enemies. In search of what they thought was freedom, they fell under bondage. Now let me explain something to you folks. You will be a servant to someone or something. There's no way out of that. What you have to decide is, okay, am I going to serve God or am I going to serve self? Am I going to serve God or the world? Am I going to serve God or the devil? And by the way, the devil doesn't care if you serve him as long as you don't serve God. He doesn't care who you serve. Just don't serve God. But you're going to be serving something. Nobody's their own man. In verse number 10, we find an interesting verse here. He said, I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. You ever see them baby birds up in a nest? 
You hear them up in there chirping, and you look in that nest, and those baby birds are looking up, and they got, got that beak open wide, and they're chirp, chirping. They're just raising up. Their eyes aren't even open. They got their mouth wide open. What are they waiting on? Food. That's right. Man, some of y'all hungry, aren't you? Most response I've got out of you, Miss Cornelia, in a long time. Mouth wide open, waiting for a big, fat, juicy night crawler. A worm. That's a night crawler's a worm. If I was a bird, I'd want a night crawler. Man, that mama bird will come in it, chew it up, mash it up, and then put it in that baby's mouth. Remember when my boys were children? I know you're going to think this is cruel. I got a kick out of how when the baby was hungry. Very little, I mean, just little, just be a week or two old. You get that bottle, and you hold it, and as soon as they see the bottle, they, their head starts going back. They're trying, they can't even raise their head yet. Uh, and open their mouth. You get that bottle close. <laughs> I used to do this. Slowly get the bottle closer, and their head would stop. And it kind of. And as it as it got right near the mouth, it is almost like you could hear a vacuum turn on. <laughs> Trying to suck that bottle into the mouth. But I didn't just stop there. Right as they started to get it, I pulled the bottle away. <laughs> they Dana, watch this. <laughs> that baby and start to cry and I'd be like, okay, okay, here. Can't have any fun. Yesterday I went to visit somebody and they had a baby about just two or three weeks old. That baby working that pacifier over. I mean, that pacifier's in the mouth and, and that thing's just working up and down. And, and baby working that thing so hard it popped out of the mouth. And that baby. So they got that thing. They picked it up off the, off the, the couch or whatever they were sitting on there. And, and they held up that baby in the back. I mean, just, it just sucked it in. They can suck it in. Hey, I, I think a baby's been known to suck in a bottle from 12 inches away. Powerful force. And when he says, open thy mouth wide, sort of the picture it draws there. When a baby's hungry, he'll open his mouth before the food is even close. He's desiring that food. When the baby gets a little older and no longer on on bottle, but maybe baby food or table food, you get that, you get that, bo- that, that spoonful of food and you hold it up. You say, open up. Now, here's what I've learned. You only have to say open up if it's spinach or something that they don't like. But if it's something they like, and here's what I found, too. I don't know about you, but with me, I, I, I don't think it's possible to feed a baby with a spoon and keep your own mouth shut. Have you ever noticed that? You say, open up. And when you try to feed the baby... You open up. I try to help them. Anybody else in here do that or am I the only one? Oh, thank you. I don't feel so weird after all. And the others, you did it. You just didn't know it. When the baby is not hungry, though, or when it's something that the baby doesn't want, they don't open that mouth, do they? They'll turn their head. Sometimes they'll purse their lips together. And if you finally trick them some way into opening the mouth, you get them to laugh and say, ah, ah, and stick it in real quick. I've done that. Get, hey, hey, making the silly noise, ah, and stick it in there. And here's what they mean. They spit it out. Now listen, God was saying, Israel, that's exactly what you did with me. So, man, I wanted to, I wanted to feed you. I wanted to, 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 to be with you. I wanted to be your God and you be my people. And I gave you my commandments and my doctrines and my laws because I wanted to bless you and I wanted you to experience the best of what I had planned for you. And if you would have just opened your mouth up wide, figuratively speaking, I would have filled it full of my blessings. I said, but you would none of me. You wouldn't hearken. You spit it out. You pursed your lips together. 
Opening the mouth describes someone who's eager to receive something. You see, the Lord, he desired to fight their battles for them. He desired to protect them. He desired to provide for them. He desired to bless them and to guide them. He desired to act on their behalf. He desired, listen, he said, I just wanted for you to be satisfied. That's it. I had plans for you. I had a purpose for you. Out of all the nations in the world, I called you out to be my people. Jesus said in Matthew 5, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And G, or the Lord said back there in Psalm 81, He said, Listen, if you just open your mouth wide, I would have filled it. What is it you need? You need some strength? Open your mouth wide to me, I'll fill it. But you need some wisdom. You're confused. You have some big decisions to make. You don't know what to do. Well, open your mouth wide. I'll fill it. What you need some provisions. What you need a companion. You just need me to be your God. You need a Savior. Open your mouth wide and I'll fill it, he says. Opening the mouth wide describes not only someone who's eager to receive something that describes someone who's obedient. See, when I, the baby's eating, you say, open up. Sometimes they don't like what you have to give them. I've told you before about my son, Chad, when I, I, I love spinach, and I, I was eating spinach, and I was brainwashing him. I was saying, oh, this is good. I love spinach. I looked at him and said, you want some? And I got just a little bit on the end of a fork, and I put it in his mouth, and he went, And then, he, he, then he, he swallowed it, and I said, that's good. And then he went, want some more? Open up. Now, he didn't like it, but he obeyed Dad. He trusted Dad. He doesn't anymore after that. He never trusted me again. No, he does. He trusted me. Okay, Dad wants me to eat that. I'm going to eat it. He says he let them walk in their own counsels. In Psalm 81, 12, I gave them, so I gave them up unto their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsels. He said, they didn't walk in my counsels. They didn't walk in my desires. If they had, they would have been so glad because I would have satisfied them. I, had, I told them that they would be blessed, but they didn't listen. They didn't obey. They had to do it their way. Verse 12, so I gave them up into their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsels, their own selfish desires. They walked in their own plans. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 30, he said this, they would none of my counsel. They didn't, they didn't want it, they despised it, they rejected it. They despised all my reproof. None of my purposes or plans. They didn't want any of They didn't want to have anything to do with me, God said. They didn't want my advice. They didn't want my guidance. They, they wanted just to do it their own way, and they wanted to do what they wanted to do regardless of what I said about it. Listen now, man's own counsels, man's own plans, and man's own desires apart from God always lead to heartache and destruction. Always. You realize when God created everything, he reached down in that, that river bank or wherever he grabbed up that clay, that lump of clay. He molded it, the Bible says, into a man in God's own image. Nothing else was made in his image, just man. And he breathed into man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He looked down and said, it's not good for man to be alone, and so he calls Adam to fall asleep, and he took a rib out of his side, and he fashioned that rib into a, a lady, I think God's crowning achievement. And he 
breathed into her the breath of life. He took extra care when he created man. Man fell, turned from God in rebellion and, and fell and, and, and went into sin. And God said, man, I, I can't allow him into heaven with that sin, but I love him and I don't want him to go to hell. So he said, I, the wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. Somehow, how, how's that going to be paid? I, I don't want man to go to hell. I want him to come to heaven. Do you realize he loved me and you so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross and pay for our sins? When Jesus hung on that cross, the Bible says he became sin for us. He took all our sin on his own body. Come here a minute, Parson. This is my youngest. Here, step up here so that everybody can see it. This is my youngest son, Carson. This is my fifth one. Living with him is like living with a cartoon character. I'm telling you what. On the way to school, I'll, I'll take Carson to school a lot of times. And I'll, I'll tell him, I love you. And what do you usually like to say? No, you say something, not too. I love you. He'll always say, I love you more. And I'll say, no, you can't love me more. He said, yeah, I do. I said, I can prove that you don't, son. Oh. And then I'll tell you, I love you more than what? That's right. I said, I love you more than life. But son, if, if, if somebody's getting ready to shoot at you, I wouldn't have to think twice about it. I'd jump in front of you. I would give my life for you. I love you that much. And the Bible says, no greater love hath a man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. So son, that's the greatest kind of love. You, you may love me as much, but you can't love me that much. Do, would you give your life for me? And he said, I don't know about that. <laughs> I love this boy more than my own life. Brother Barry, stand up a minute, Brother Barry. Brother Barry's our youth pastor. I love Brother Barry. He's my friend. Don't come up here. You've been sick. I don't want you, I don't want you near me. He's my friend. I love Brother Barry. But if Brother Barry ever went out and murdered somebody and got taken to court and found guilty of murder in the first degree, and they said, hey, you're going to have to die uh, in the electric chair for your crime. And he said, hey, there's got to be some way out. And they said, well, I'll tell you what, if your friend, Pastor Wise, will put his son Carson in the electric chair and let him die for your crime, you can go free. Now, Brother Barry, let me just tell you. If that ever happened, and it won't happen that way, but if it did, I would not give my son. I would break out to sing and burn, baby, burn. <laughs> as much as a friend as you are. But do you understand, I love my son. You can be seated. Not you. Here's Brother Barry. But God loved you and I so much. Listen to this. That he gave his son willingly. And Jesus Christ, before he ever got to that cross, he was beaten, abused. His body laid open from that whipping with that cat of nine tails. Face bruised and swollen from the beating with the rod. Beard plucked from his face. Crown of thorns placed on his head. And all that, the Bible says he wasn't even recognizable. His beating was so bad. And they placed him on a cross. They nailed his, hand, nailed his hands and his feet to that cross. And he hung there and he bore our sins for us. On that cross he died as a liar even though he had never lied. He died as a murderer. He died as a rapist. He died as a thief even though he had never done any of those things. Hey, that's a lot of love right there. That's more love. Listen, I love you people here. I love my church family. But let me tell you something. I, I don't think I can give my son for you. God did. But man's own counsels, man's own plans, man's own desires apart from God always leads to destruction. Do you not realize if a God loves us that much, he has a purpose and a plan for you? 
and he has your best interest in mind and he has he, he wants you to know that joy unspeakable and full of glory and that that peace that passes understanding don't you know that he's a good father and yet we'll jerk our shoulder away we'll purse our lips together and say i want to do it my way this is my life proverbs 14:12 there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs chapter 1, starting verse 24, it says this, Because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hands and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. He said, I reached my hand out to you, but you wouldn't even regard it. I called out to you. You plugged your ears. You didn't want to have anything to do with me. And he said, because of that, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. God said, listen, if you're going to do that. You're just heading the wrong direction. You know, a lot of what we go through in life is not necessarily God's judgment. It's just the natural course of the bad decisions we make. You know, if, if I choose to take my car and go 100 miles an hour and run into a tree, well, that was a bad choice. And I'm going to suffer some consequences, aren't I? I can't blame it on anybody. Well, that's stinking Chevrolet people. They shouldn't have made the car that'll go 100 miles an hour. No, I just shouldn't have gone 100 miles an hour. And I bet you shouldn't have headed towards a tree. And God said, listen, what you've done, you're, you're going 100 miles an hour towards a tree and, and you're going you're gonna to be destructed because of that. Hey, follow me, turn to me. Open thy mouth. Here's several things to open your mouth wide to, to the word of God. He said, hearken to my voice, hearken to my words. He was calling out to them. He was trying to lead them. He was trying to teach them and instruct them. He wanted to be their God. He wanted to be their father. You know how God speaks to us? Listen, folks, it's not that little chill up and down your spine. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God found in the Bible. When you neglect to read the Word of God, when you neglect to study the Word of God, you're not opening your mouth so that He can fill it. He said, man, listen, I have the ways of righteousness. I have the, the, the way of life. It's right here in my Word. He's calling out for you, but are you listening? He's calling out for you, but are you searching for him? Have you ever been separated from somebody and trying to find them? It can be hard to find somebody, can it? Unless you're calling out to them and they're calling out to you. If you're searching for me, say, hey, where are you? I'm over here. Hey, keep talking. I'll follow your voice. Right? I went hunting with Will Harville uh, last year. We stayed in our stands. He was a good ways off from me, and we stayed in our stands. It was dark. I mean, it got real dark, and I'm waiting for him. To, he's further into the woods than I am, and, and uh, I'm waiting for him. Finally, I, I see his flashlight. I see his little light coming. And I thought, okay, well, he knows these woods. That's the first time I'd ever been to that area. I thought, well, he knows the woods. Well, he started coming at me, and then all of a sudden he turned. He started going that way. And I thought, he's turned around, man. It is dark out here. You ever been in the woods when it is really dark? Everything looks the same? He started heading deeper into the woods. I said, hey! He stopped and the light turns towards me. And I got my flashlight and I shine towards him. You know what he did? He started coming to the light. Over here! He could follow my voice. Follow the light. He was searching for me and I was calling out to him. God's calling out to you. He's giving you his word, but are you searching for him? When you willingly refuse to accept what his word says, then you're not just keeping your mouth shut, you're pursing your lips together. Remember Proverbs 125, but ye had said it, have said it not all my counsel, and ye would none of my reproofs. Zechariah 7, 11 and 12, but they refused to hearken. 
and pulled away the shoulder. They stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their heart uh, uh, their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words of the Lord of hosts that sent by a spirit. So they, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with my word. You ever said, well, I know what the Bible says, but. You know what you're doing? You're pursing your lips and concentrating. I want to take care of it. Hey, open your mouth in regards to the church. Now, let me tell you something. Coming to church will not get you to heaven, okay? Can I tell you that? That's not, that's not the purpose of church. Only Jesus Christ gets you to heaven. Do you know that the church was instituted by God for our good? And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give us teachers and pastors and, and apostles and evangelists? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And sometimes we act like, well, I don't need church. I can worship God at home. And you know what? You sure can. But worship it in the purpose of the church. Oh. <gasps> We're not supposed to work. No, we can worship here, but that's not the primary purpose. It, uh, uh, God ordained and instituted the church for our good, for our spiritual growth. Well, I've been hurt at church. I've been hurt at Walmart. When I've gone to the checkout line. Hey, I've been hurt at Food Line. Our first, first uh, when we got married, first time we went out when we uh, moved down to Florida, went to the grocery store, we didn't have anything. And I, I, we had two buggies full. We had to start from scratch. And so when they rung it up and they gave me a receipt that long and they told me the total, it hurt. But I kept going. You know why? Because they had some stuff I needed. It's a place that we can come to encourage others in the Lord. It's a place that we can come and be encouraged in the Lord. It's a place we can come and sit under teachers and preachers and evangelists and pastors and learn. Hey, let me ask you something. Here's where we go, uh, uh, get off, uh, off track here with, with church. What is it, when you come to church, what is it you expect from church? Well, let me ask you this. What is it you contribute when you're at church? See, that's the question. Let me ask you this. Uh, what do you expect to leave with? Let me ask you another one. What do you attempt to bring? What purpose does the church feel in your life? What purpose do you feel in the church? You see, we come together. It's not just a worship, although we'll do that, man. We'll praise the Lord and, and sing in Christ alone. We'll sing some hymns together. But I, I, I come to church also because, man, I, I want to hear the preacher. I want to hear the teacher. I want to learn something about God's Word. And, and I want to see Brother George because he encourages me. And, and I want to see Tyler, but, yeah, he encourages me. There may be somebody else that I can encourage and somebody else that I can help and that I can be a blessing to. You see, one reason we, we leave church sometimes and feel like, well, that didn't do much for me is because we didn't come with our mouth wide open. Right? Sometimes we'll, me and my family will go somewhere. We'll say family reunion. I love family reunions because I like to eat. It's amazing. All this food. I mean, there's food everywhere. I'm just eating and eating. The kids will eat a roll, two, two pieces of fried okra, and a chicken leg. He goes, I'm, I'm full. Can I go play? Well, you need to eat some more. No, no I'm, I'm full. Are you really full? Yeah, I'm full. Okay, they go play. We, we're there for hours. When we leave, look, no, five minutes on the road, are we going to stop somewhere and get something to eat? Do what? Okay, can we stop at McDonald's? Can we get some chicken nuggets? Chicken nuggets. And they just cooked a pig back there, man. And they just had all that home cooking, that, that banana pudding and that coconut cake. We, we had all kinds of stuff. But I'm starving. My, my son Lance, his phrase is, I'm starving to death. Here's the line we've used sometimes. If you left hungry, it's your fault. Right? And God says, listen, I wanted to fill your mouth. I wanted to bless you. I had some things for you at church. And I, I had some things for you in, in the word of God. But you, you kept your mouth closed. And if, if you're hungry and searching now, it's your fault. Because you didn't come with your mouth open. When you come to church, are you coming with a mouth wide open? 
with the attitude, Lord, what do you have for me today? Lord, how can I be used today? Hey, how about in prayer? We sing that song, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Jeremiah 33, 3, he says this, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Deuteronomy 4, 29, he says, listen, if you turn from me, you're going to be going into bondage. And then he tells what to do in bondage. He says, but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou shalt seek him with all thine heart and with all thy soul. Isaiah 55, 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. One of the secrets to the Christian life is this right here, just opening your mouth wide and desiring to know God. Being eager to know God. Reading that book there uh, uh, like it's a love letter. Saying, oh God, would you speak to me? Praying to him, oh God, would you hear me? Going to church with, with God's people, oh God. Well, well, how can I be used to help others? How can I be used to minister to others? Open thy mouth wide. Let me ask you something right now. Or, or tell you what, let, let's do it this way. I, I'm, I'm done. Bow your head and close your eyes for me for just a moment, please. We're going to get ready to have an invitation here.